Dave. We just spent the last hour uh, going through how open air works and what's wrong with data exchange and creating a longitudinal data record of patients. You shared some super interesting, exciting, um, super interesting examples of how patients are basically doing that by themselves in the US. So tell me, what are you excited about the open air event next week? Well, why I'm excited about the, uh, the the event next week is I am finally, after 15 years of visions and evangelizing and futuristic thinking and everything, I'm finally seeing the missing pieces starting to come together. And for context, it's important to understand what I've been working on uh, and evangelizing is patient empowerment, which is the ability for us to produce results uh, rather than being stopped by one thing or another. Uh, access to our medical record took years to achieve. It's finally government policy in the US and FIRE uh, provides some, it's a way of moving the data around uh, what we haven't had is any way to cope with the limitations of the data storage systems. And when I learned about open air just a few months ago, I got really excited because as you'll hear, as we discuss this, there are patients now who have been working on things that are not supported by generally available systems. And they are ready to have the ability to create the data platforms that they need. Mm -hmm. Um, you recently uh, started a blog, blog uh, about how patients use AI because there's mm -hmm. many use cases. And I actually want to ask you, what would you say that patients need to be careful about when they use AI? And so far, where did you see that AI, generative AI more specifically, has been most interesting or most useful to patients? Well, what people need to be careful about uh, as with absolutely everything in the computer, is that uh, sometimes it serves up garbage, false information, mistakes, uh, all kinds of things. I asked it once recently, who are the best speakers about patient empowerment in healthcare? Just because I was curious about who else is doing the same work that I'm doing. And one of the people it listed was Elizabeth Holmes, who is in prison for her role in fraudulently starting this company, Theranos. She isn't a patient empowerment speaker at all. What you need to do is view generative AI as a super enthusiastic, productive assistant who makes mistakes. So you can say, hey, draft a memo for me on this subject, but then you better read it <laughs> before you before you publish it. And the same is true with using this kind of tool. Uh, but one of the, the, the most brilliant patient AI user I know in the world is Hugo Campos, who lives in Oakland. Uh, and he always says, you know, whether it's a doctor or an AI, before you make any important decisions, get a second opinion, mm -hmm. you know? So if you, you, it's not just one and done. You don't just say, hey, look at this, problem on my hand, what is it? And go make a decision. It's it's a tool to help yourself think. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I totally agree. And it was super inspiring to hear from uh, Grace uh, Vinton and uh, Grace Cordovano recently in Boston when they were explaining how patients are using AI and basically, especially with claims that get denied and you can use AI to try to yes. help with drafting a response. I always warn people that by now we also already know what you uh, wrote with the help of ChatGPT. It's just we sense what the language is. So it's always good to, as you said, double check, change um, and improve the insight that you get. But as an idea engine, it can do a lot of good. Three things that you're going to talk about next week. Is there like what would you highlight? The most important thing has nothing to do with technology. It's the culture issue, the culture of healthcare. For centuries, patients and doctors, uh, there was essentially nothing that a patient could contribute 
to their care because they didn't have access to the knowledge that existed in doctors' books. I mean, for a long time, it turned out that doctors themselves didn't have science, right, underlying their recommendations. They did their best, but with the scientific revolution, that changed. And then for 100 years, which ended recently, just a generation ago, doctors really had good scientific information that patients couldn't get at. But with the internet, that changed, and it became possible for the first time for somebody with no connections to academic medicine to know things. And what I, what I want everyone to understand is that it is now intellectually valid for motivated patients who know how to think to be pursuing their own goals. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, Dave, I really look forward to hearing your keynote next week and uh, seeing you again in person. It really is an exciting time. I'll be telling stories of some patients and families I know who finally have the ability to extend their care for their family members without putting all the work on the doctors. And that is, that's, it's just an exciting future. And we've had the data storage, we've had data access, we've had data movement. What we haven't had is a place to create our own storage system that was tailored to our needs.